So you be must uh, you must be wondering what is our aim to be here? Why are we gathered here, right? So our aim is to help MRCOG students to ace their exam in one go. But how? How can we do that in the span of only two months? So I think this question is in every student's mind. Oh, hi, Dr. Sumbal. How are you doing? Hello, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, so you must be receiving such questions every day, don't you think? You can answer these questions better from your experience? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, so many, uh, I have already received so many questions from the students and they're really confused about how they can start the exam preparation and how they can pass the exam in one go. So many students think they can start the exam preparation after the booking. And honestly, many people did that. Am I right, everyone? Please write in the chat box. How many of you have already started the exam preparation? Uh, Dr. Sumbal, could you please speak a little louder? We can't really hear you properly. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what I was saying is that uh, so many students think they can start the exam preparation after the booking, and many people did that. So I was asking everyone, uh, is that uh, the case with you, everyone? Please do let me know how many of you have already started the exam preparation. Can I speak? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes, I start uh, my preparation even I don't uh, booking for uh, next July exam because I'm too late for uh, booking. So mm -hmm. my exam, I guess, will be in uh, next January, inshallah. But by anyhow, I start uh, preparation uh, nowadays. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, you did the right thing. And honestly, that's a very smart approach. Uh, because uh, we all are doctors and we have busy schedules, so it's a wise thing if you started your exam preparation by now. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's address the gen uh, January students at the end of the session, but let's try to help the students who are appearing in the July, uh, the ones who have less time. Uh, yes, definitely. So what I recommend to our students, uh, first of all, uh, don't mess your minds with books at this point uh, because you have very limited time to sit uh, in the July exam. Uh, so what I recommend, just grab the recorded lectures uh, which we have already prepared from different resources and gather all the important knowledge there. So what I'm trying to say is use these 60 days by watching already prepared lectures by our team uh, you may practice recalls on our website, and uh, most importantly, you can practice those SDS with me on Telegram group. And after that, I will conduct a mock so that I shall know where do my students stand in terms of the exam preparation. And according to that, I will provide them the feedback and I will work on you all. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good. So, ma'am, uh, you mean that they don't have to open the books? They can just watch the lectures and they, they will be done with the concepts. Is that what you're mm -hmm. trying to say? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, because uh, we have uh, we're currently going a premium session in which uh, we primarily worked on our students and we had them to build their foundations uh, because uh, in the MRCG one uh, part one curriculum, uh, we have all the basic subjects and those subjects require uh, are very clear concepts. One must have crystal clear conce concepts on those subjects. So uh, in our recorded lectures and we have the PDFs, uh, we particularly highlight source points, uh, which would help you to pass the exam and also meanwhile, they clear you all the concepts uh, regarding your basic subjects.
That's wonderful. So Dr. Sumbhadi is telling you guys that you just need to listen to the lectures and just practice the recalls and then you will have the chance to pass the exam. In in one Everyone's in the body. Okay, Dr. Sambo, we have a premium students as well here as they don't want to miss any of your important lectures. Uh, and so why don't we take their feedback as well? Oh yeah, that seems a nice idea. We can do that. So anyone from our students who have done half of their preparation and they would like to share and guide other students, how is their journey with us so far? So we have Dr. Sana, Dr. Noor, Dr. Ruby, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Saima as well, and Dr. Alia. So who's with us? Uh, can you speak, ma'am? Sure, ma'am. Actually, ma'am, uh, I uh, I'm taking your uh, uh, class on uh, WhatsApp group uh, for SBS, and these are really amazing, and uh, you people are uh, very. Uh, uh, good with us and you reply uh, to us within minutes and that's that's amazing i'm uh, i really appreciate uh, this thing of you uh, you all and um, i'm totally satisfied with your lectures with your uh, exam preparation thank you hi ma'am can i speak am i audible sure. yes yes you are Okay, um, I'm Dr. Sana. I'm from your um, premium group. I'll be really honest uh, with my opinion. I'm really grateful to, jo to join this course as um, everyone in this um, med institute or family is really helpful and motivating. And they are um, always available to guide and support and help and motivate in every way possible. So I'm really grateful and I'm really happy to join this course. And more of if in person, I wouldn't have joined this course. I wouldn't be able to book my seat in the first place. So I'm really um, thankful to Dr. Minhal, Dr. Sumbal, Dr. Sadia. Like everyone in this group is so helpful and so motivating. So yeah, it's the best. <laughs> Thank you so much for your kind words. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So Dr. Ruby, would you like to share your experience? Like how's your preparation now and how med institutes, Dr. Simbal and the backend team help you from, your, uh, from booking your exam and prepare for your exam? Anyone from the premium students, Dr. Bridget, we have Dr. Bridget, we have Dr. Bhavna, we have Dr. Noor as well. Would you like to share your experience with other students? All right. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Bridget. I'm grateful to the group and, the, and our tutors who have been supportive in answering questions and preparing us for um, daily sessions where we answer questions and I'm really grateful. Um, I'm still preparing and you know with the work it's kind of sometimes hard, sometimes I miss the lectures but thank you because we we usually we get access to the recorded to the recordings and it has really been helpful and we are looking forward, I am looking forward as Bridget to see this exam in my first attempt so I just wish all of you the best. I pray that we continue to work as a team and yeah, work harder. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for your feedback. Um, so uh, let's just start our session now and we will take the other students' feedback at the end of the session. All right. So Dr. Sambu, you may start now. 
Okay, uh, today we are going to start our first module, uh, which is anatomy. And this is a very important subject for the exam. Uh, what I'm going to do today, I will start with an overview and I will break down each region's SPS into abdomen, pelvis, and perineum, uh, which would uh, help you to stay organized and well prepared. So let's start uh, with an overview of anatomy of abdomen and its SPS. Okay, uh, it's a brief overview of ab interior abdominal wall. When we look at the abdominal wall, particularly interior abdominal wall, uh, we have different layers. Try to remember uh, the sequence, uh, how each layer is there on the interior abdominal wall. So initially we have uh, the skin, which is the outermost layer of the abdominal wall. Below the skin, we have subcutaneous tissue, and this subcutaneous tissue is further divided into superficial campus fascia and deeper scarpus fascia. Here you can see in the diagram, uh, this is the first layer, first and the outermost layer, skin. And then we have the campus fascia and the scarpus fascia. Following that, uh, this is the symmetry throughout our body that we have skin, we have skin tissues, uh, we have fascia, and below fascia, we have muscles. So what are the muscles of the interior abdominal wall? The main muscles include external oblique muscle, internal oblique muscle, and transversus abdominis muscle. And following these muscles, then we have another layer of fascia, which is fascia transversalis. Below the transversalis fascia, there is finally parietal peritoneum. And why uh, we are starting with the layers of abdominal wall? Uh, the answer to this is, that we, uh, in the ops and gynae, we do many surgeries on the abdomen and we do uh, give the incision to the patient. So it's important that you are well oriented about which layers of the abdominal wall you are going to incise during the surgery. And what is significant uh, from the exam point of view, sometimes you might encounter with any SBA in which they ask you about the correct sequence of the uh, layers of the interior abdominal wall. So again, try to remember in the sequence uh, from the outermost layer to the innermost layer. And sometimes what they do, they reverse the order just to make you confuse. What they do, they ask you in the question that uh, uh, arrange the following layers from inside to outside. Then in the, that case, you have to reverse the orders, choose the option and go uh, reverse in the reverse manner, starting from the peritoneum and ending at skin. Here is another tip. Whenever you are solving SPS and when you are writing your exam, make sure you read the question statement carefully and read all the options carefully. Uh, what, uh, what is the normal psychology of the students? What they do, uh, they just quickly read the SPA and they feel somehow overconfident that this is a very simple question. I knew the answer and they rush and go uh, with the wrong answers. So always, always uh, read your statement carefully uh, and read the options carefully. So what is the function of anterior abdominal wall? It protects your internal abdominal organs. It stabilizes your trunk. Uh, it helps to increase your intra-abdominal pressure, uh, for example, during coughing, defecating, or vomiting. So what are the muscles of anterior lateral abdominal wall? So we have five key muscles. Again, number one, transversus abdominis muscle, internal abdominal oblique muscle, rectus abdominis muscle, external ab abdominal oblique muscle, and finally, paramedialis muscle. So here in the diagram, you can see all of the muscles of the anterior lateral wall. Uh, here is the rectus abdominis muscle, uh, then uh, here is this one is the internal abdominal oblique muscle. Here in the transverse, uh, why these names are given to these muscles? Be according, because it is according to the arrangement of their fibers. So it's very evident the transversal, uh, transversus abdominis muscles have transverse uh, muscle fibers. 
uh, then internal, uh, internal oblique muscle have uh, the fibers which are moving upward. In this diagram, the external oblique muscle is not shown. However, the fibers of the external oblique muscle are moving downwards. It's just like you are putting your hands in your pockets. So it's moved that direction, uh, the fibers of the external oblique muscle. There is a mnemonic to remember the names uh, of these muscles, which is diaphragm. T stands for transversus abdominis, I for internal abdominal oblique, R for rectus abdominis, and E for external abdominal oblique muscle. And finally, P stands for pyramidalis muscle. Uh, before we uh, move further, a quick re uh, reminder, our Power Hour course is now available at a discounted price uh, for the next 24 hours only. So don't miss out on this opportunity. You are getting our course in just two days. Uh, $125. Uh, let me outline the courses we offer and what they include. Uh, currently, we are offering two courses. One is a comprehensive course and the other one is a power hour course. In comprehensive course, uh, you will uh, get organized schedule under the guidance of our CG examiner. Uh, you will get mini schedule of all the subjects. Uh, inter, uh, interactive live sessions, recording for all the sessions. Uh, you may get comprehensive notes, uh, which are available in the PDF form. Uh, we have intensive two hours of daily discussion and SBA practice with the mentors. Uh, we have subject-wise solved three calls, uh, which are available on our website. Again, we have year-wise three calls, which are also available on our website. Uh, we have all the books and supplementary material, uh, which are all of these things are uh, are there only under one platform. All you have to do is just to log in, go in the comprehensive course, and there you find all of the material which is uh, which which you need to pass the exam. Then we have uh, we arrange mock after every subject on our website. Uh, then we have the uh, other course which is Power Hour course. It is also a structured course which is guided by RCG examiners. In this uh, particular course, uh, we have interactive live sessions, uh, which are subject wise. We have recording of all the sessions. Uh, we have daily to our recall practice with mentors, uh, subject wise recall practice, year wise recall practice, and you may have access to all our SBA pool. And after, after each module, we again arrange a mock test for you after each subject. And once you are done with the subject wise mock exams, then final, we have uh, three big mocks for you. And trust me, that's all you need to pass this exam with a structured approach. Uh, because if you follow this pattern, uh, you will revise uh, all the SBAs a minimum of three times. If you uh, do that, because revision, uh, revision is the key to pass this exam, if you thoroughly practice SBAs and do maximum revision, a minimum of three times, then nothing can stop to pass you this exam. So let's get back to the anatomy of abdomen. Uh, this is the topic which many of you frequently confuse, like, Many of you find it difficult to remember the level of vertebra of each artery of the abdominal iota. So let me give you a brief. At the level of T12, we know from where this abdominal iota is coming from. Uh, this is basically, uh, we have left ventricle, which pumps out all the blood through the system into the systemic circulation. And this abdominal iota is the part of your system, system, systematic circulation. So what happens at the level of T12 vertebra? Uh, in a simple way, if you remember, uh, at the end of your thoracic cavity, and we know the final thoracic vertebra is T12. So at that uh, level, our abdominal iota begins. So it is very easy to remember the level of T12, which is the end of our thoracic cavity and the beginning of the abdominal cavity, 
uh, marks the origin of celiac trunk. So T12 vertebral level is stands for the origin of celiac artery from the abdominal aorta. If you remember in the sequence, then you will never forget the vertebral levels. So relate everything. Celiac trunk is the first branch of the abdominal aorta, which originates at the level of T12. If we move downward, now imagine you are moving uh, into the abdominal cavity from upwards to downward direction. And remember uh, what vistas and what structures come in your way. Uh, when you are uh, when you are understanding the blood supply of the abdomen. So we are done with the celiac trunk. Uh, the celiac trunk is mainly responsible for the blood supply of your foregut. So now you are done with the blood supply of the foregut, uh, which includes your liver, uh, your stomach, your spleen, and your pancreas. Then we have our next artery, the next branch of abdominal aorta is a superior mesentic artery. Now imagine after foregut, what would come, uh, what thing, what structure would come into your mind? Uh, that's uh, your midgut. And the next artery is superior mesentic artery. So superior mesentic artery is the blood supply for your midgut. And uh, now we are done with T12. We are moving forward, uh, downward. Now, what would be the next vertebra? L1. So superior mesentic artery originates at the level of L1. The next uh, structure we have are two structures. We have two kidneys and we have uh, gonads. In the female, we have ovaries. So at the level of L2, uh, the, the artery, the branch of the abdominal aorta is the gonadal artery and the renal artery. So classically, uh, renal artery comes from the intervertebral disc level, uh, which is somewhere uh, from the lower border of L1 and the upper border of L2. However, the gonadal artery uh, originates at the level of L2. Now we are done with the, uh, I'm summarizing again so that you can remember now. T12, end of thoracic cavity, beginning of the abdominal cavity, T12, celiac trunk, done. Then we have, uh, following our foregut, we have uh, our midgut, the next artery, superior mesentic artery at the level of L1. Following that, we have uh, our renal, we, our kidneys, and we have gonads. The renal artery comes from the uh, level of lower border of L1 and upper border of L2. Gonadal artery comes from uh, the level of L2. And uh, once we are done with L2, now comes downward. Now we have our hindgut. And the blood supply to the hindgut is through inferior mesentic artery, which is the branch originates at the level of L3. Now moving downwards, we have the terminal branch of the abdominal aorta, which is median sacral artery. It is the last branch of the abdominal aorta, and it originates at the level of L4. Meanwhile, L4 holds other, other sig uh, significance as well, because at the level of L L4, this abdominal aorta bifurcates into right and left common iliac arteries. Further, if we move downwards to the L5 level, now what happens? This common iliac artery further divides into uh, external and internal iliac artery. So the landmark for the internal and external iliac artery bifurcation is to L5 to S1. So remember, many of you confuse that. Uh, once you find uh, the key word in the SBA that bifurcation of uh, iota, uh, you quickly jumped on the L4 level. Please again, try to read the statement carefully. Either they are asking about the bifurcation of common iliac artery, or are they asking about the bifurcation of abdominal aorta? So these two terms are different. So make sure to read that again and mark accordingly L4 for abdominal aorta bifurcation and L5 to S1 for common iliac uh, artery bifurcation into internal and external iliac artery. Am I clear so far? Yes, ma'am. If you have any question, you can ask me in the chat box. And I always encourage my students to open their mic and uh, they can ask the questions directly.
Okay, so if you understand the arterial supply, that would become very easier for you to understand the venous drainage of the abdomen because all the arteries, uh, uh, all the veins and their tributaries are according to the, their arterial supply, they have the same name only with a few exceptions. Okay, let's start. Uh, whenever you are understanding about the arterial supply, try to start from the heart. And whenever you are understanding or reading the topic of venous drainage, try to start from the, uh, from the bottom line, uh, like uh, in a simple way, uh, understand the flow of blood towards the heart. And when it comes to the arterial, try to understand the flow of the blood away from the heart. So now we are going towards the heart. For that, we have to start from the below. You can see here the internal iliac veins and external iliac veins. They are giving, uh, they are draining into common iliac veins. And these common iliac veins are directly go into the inferior vena cava. The exception here is that uh, when you look at the left side, the left ovarian or testicular vein dra drains into the left renal vein whereas right ovarian or testicular drains into inferior vena cava. Here you can see in the right side, this is right gonadal artery. Either it could be ovarian or testicular. You can see here it is directly uh, giving tributary to the inferior vena cava. But when you see on the left side, it is very, very obvious the left gonadal artery is draining into left renal vein instead of inferior vena cava directly. So what it do, it, uh, it will give tributary to the left renal vein and this left renal vein would drain into inferior vena cava. So this is the difference. Uh, try to remember again, the difference between uh, right and the left uh, venous drainage of the abdominal, uh, abdominal wall or the abdomen. Now let's understand about the peripheral nervous system. So peripheral nervous system is mainly formed by the spinal nerves. There are total 31 pairs of spinal nerves in our body. We have eight pairs of cervical a nerve, uh, eight pairs, we have 12 pairs thoracic spinal nerves. Then we have five pairs of uh, lumbar. Then we have five pairs of sexual and one pair of coccygeal. And all these spinal nerves, all these 31 pairs of nerves form different plexus in our body in order to make the peripheral nervous system. So what are the main four plexus? C1 to C4 uh, combine to form cervical plexus, which is the main plexus of our, our head and neck. Then we have the brachial plexus, which starts from C5 to T1, which is the main innervation of our upper limb. Then L1, and L4 and a few fibers from the T12 combine to form lumbar plexus. And following that, from the L4 to S4 combines to form sacral plexus. Uh, yes, Dr. Hayal, uh, you may ask your question. Assalamu alaikum, uh, ma'am. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Actually, I just want to give a little feedback uh, regarding your theory course. Uh, yes, uh, can I quit now or ahead. later on? Hello? Uh, yeah, you can give your feedback. Uh, actually, I am from uh, a regular uh, theory course of med institutes. And uh, as today is, uh, I think, recall session uh, for recalls. Uh, actually, I want to say thank you, first of all, to med institutors and especially uh, Dr. Minhal, uh, because he is every time available. The good point uh, for your team and uh, Dr. Minhal is that he is every time available, whether it is on group or it is on um, her private number. He is every time available, and uh, the whole team and ma'am especially uh, have a quick uh, response every time. And the other thing is that. Uh, especially your lectures, Ma'am Sumwal, are very much interesting and uh, full of uh, knowledge. And uh, I don't think uh, if I am uh, doing your uh, lectures, especially, and uh, with full interest, with full concentration, then I don't think uh, that there will be any uh, SP in the paper that will come out from it. 
so thank, thank you, you uh, for uh, for making uh, so much efforts for us thank you so much ma'am thank you okay okay so we were talking about the peripheral nervous system so uh, now let me summarize we have cervical plexus brachial plexus lumbar plexus and sacral plexus for the mrcg1 exam point of view uh, we have important plexus are lumbar plexus and sacral plexus So let's have a look at uh, lumbar plexus. The spinal nerves from uh, T12 uh, to L4 forms a lumbar plexus. And here are the main branches. Uh, we have iliohypogastric nerve, ilionguinal nerve, genitofemoral nerve, lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. We have femoral nerve and obturator nerve. And here is a mnemonic to remember that. Uh, it's a very easy mnemonic. I get uh, leftovers on Fridays. I stands for iliohypogastric. Another I stands for ilioinguinal. Then we have genitofemoral. Uh, L stands for lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. O stands for obturator nerve. And S stands for femoral nerve. Your task is to remember the root values. Iliohypogastric nerve, uh, as you can see here, it is mainly coming from the L1, and uh, meanwhile, it is receiving some fibers from the T12 level as well. However, the main uh, root value is the L1. Uh, Ilionguinal nerve, uh, it is coming from the L1 level. Then we have the genitofemoral nerve. It, uh, it is sharing the fibers from the L1 and L2. Lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, it is receiving the fibers from the L2 and the L3 level. Femoral and obturator nerve are both come from the L2, L3, and L4 levels. So this is the summary. Uh, try to remember each and every root values of all the nerves of lumbar plexus. Then we have the sacral plexus. It is a network of nerves which formed by the lumbosacral trunk. L4, L5, and sacral spinal nerves, S1 to S4. In the sacral plexus, we have superior gluteal nerve, inferior gluteal nerve, sciatic nerve. This sciatic nerve further divides into tibial portion and co common fibular portion, which is also known as common uh, peroneal nerve. Then we have posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, pudendal nerve and some other branches like nerve to piriformis, nerve to obturator internus, and nerve to quadratus femoris. So the root value of a superior gluteal nerve is L4, L5, and S1. Then inferior gluteal nerve have root value L5, S1, and S2. Together they give inferior gluteal nerve. Then we have sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve carries the fiber from all of the root values which is L4, L5, S1, 2, and 3. And now look at the difference between tibial portion, common fibular portion. The tibial portion uh, have all the root values, L4 to S3, whereas in common fibular portion, S3 is not there. So make sure when you are marking any SPA, make sure you exclude the S3 from the, uh, when if you are going to choose common peroneal nerve or common fibula, uh, fibular portion. Uh, then uh, you need to exclude S3 from the root value. Uh, then the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, it comes from the S1, 2, and 3. And pudendal nerve, this is very important and frequently, frequently asked in the uh, exam about the root value of pudendal nerve. They ask you this uh, about this nerve through various, various ways. So remember S2, S3, and S4. Dermatomes are the areas of the skin, each of which is connected to a single spinal nerve. Together, these areas create a surface map of the body. Here is the, uh, this is how uh, they have made a surface map on the body, and here is the key of these areas. So for the exam point of view, in the RCG curriculum, they have clearly, clearly mentioned uh, about the topics uh, which they are expecting from you on the exam day. So they mainly focus on the anatomy of abdomen, pelvis, and perineum. So 
mainly you, you will get questions from each of the segment from these particular regions. So now let, uh, let's have a look uh, what are important dermatomes we have. Uh, remember T10, which is level of umbilicus. Here you can see on the body map T10. And I think many of you already knew, uh, knew this dermatome. Then we have T12, which is for inguinal or groin region. And what else we have? S2, S3, and S4 for the perineum. So remember uh, these uh, map keys. S2, S3, S4 for perineum. T10 for the umbilicus. T12 for inguinal or groin regions. And sometimes they do ask about the level of nipples, that is T4. So these dermatomes are important, uh, just memorize them. Now uh, let's start our SPA practice from the abdomen. Question uh, one, while performing laparoscopy, the lateral umbilical folds can be seen on the interior abdominal wall in the adult. These structure contains option A, inferior epigastric vessel, B, obturator vessel, uh, C is again obturator uh, vessel, D, obliterated umbilical arteries, E, ovarian vessels. You have 60 seconds to answer this question. Okay, uh, well done. Option A, inferior epigastric vessel is the, is the right answer. So the lateral umbilical folds are bilateral raised ridges of the parietal peritoneum in the deep aspect of the interior abdominal wall, uh, overlying the inferior epigastric vessels. Uh, let me show you from the diagram. Here you can see the lateral umbilical fold. And below that, you can see uh, how it is overlying the inferior epigastric artery and vein as well. So this is the lateral umbilical fold. Similarly, uh, we have the medial umbilical fold and the median umbilical folds. And simply, these folds are formed due to the thickening of the peritoneum. The parietal peritoneum gives rise to the formation of these uh, umbilical folds. Is everyone clear? Yes, ma'am. Which vessel can possibly be injured in the subcutaneous tissue when a transverse suprapubic skin incision is made? Okay, so we have a variety of answers. Many of you choose E, A, and D. The answer is A, 
superficial epigastric artery. It is a branch of femoral artery and runs obliquely upwards and medially across the lower abdomen. It supplies blood to the skin, subcutaneous tissue of the lower abdominal wall below the umbilicus. The artery can be encountered during a transverse suprapubic skin incision. Here you can see this is the transverse suprapubic incision. And this question particularly asks about the blood supply below the umbilical level. So here you can see again how this uh, superficial epigastric artery is uh, supplying the area below the umbilicus, or you can say in the suprapubic region. Is everyone clear who answered E and D? I know why you are confusing with the option C, deep cir circumflex iliac artery. I have another SPA uh, from the blood supply of interior abdominal wall. Uh, when you see that diagram, then uh, this SPA also make more sense to you. For now, just see, have a look here, uh, because anatomy is all about visual learning. If you see the diagram, if you know where the structure, uh, where a structure is exactly located, uh, then it would uh, help you to retain more information. So here you, it is very obvious how superficial epigastric artery is supplying uh, the area below the umbilicus. And here we give the, uh, we give the suprapubic incision. Which structure blocks the blood supply to a loop of small intestine um, in the femoral ring causing the strangulated femoral hernia? Uh, Dr. Bridget, your question is, can this vessel be injured during log digital incision too? Uh, well, uh, they, uh, the blood supply of the interior abdominal wall is very extensive and there are many, many landmarks. So we have to uh, study that accordingly, that we, at which part we are giving incision and what artery is present at that area. Arterial supply of the abdomen have regional differences. Okay, B is the correct answer. Excellent, everyone. Well done. Okay, lacunar ligament is the right answer. How it is the right answer? Uh, have a look here. This is the femoral triangle, and here is the lacunar ligament. Uh, this one is the lacunar ligament, and what happens? Uh, this is the ligament when we are doing the surgery to repair the femoral hernia. We usually release this ligament to release the pressure on the, uh, on the blood supply of the bowels of the abdomen. So femoral hernias occur when abdominal viscera or omentum pass through the femoral ring and into the potential space of the femoral canal. Strangulation happens uh, when compression of the hernia has compromised the blood supply leading to the bowel becoming ischemic and the main artery which is responsible for this ischemia or you can say the main artery which is compressed during the strangulation is the inferior epigastric artery. And the lacunar ligament is the only boundary of the femoral canal that can be cut during surgery to release the femoral hernia. Is everyone clear? Here again, you can see how inferior epigastric artery is supplying the bowel. The deep circumflex artery is a branch of which artery?
Well then, I'm glad to see so many right answers. Please, the right answer, it is a branch of external iliac artery. Again, let me clear you the blood supply of interior abdominal wall. There are many questions from this topic. So let's have a look. Where is the deep circumflex iliac artery? And it is coming from the external iliac artery. And how uh, here you can see where is the deep circumflex artery in the abdomen. It is, uh, uh, it is at the point of McBurney's point. And this is the artery which is damaged during appendectomy. So make this uh, clear. This is another SBA, uh, which artery is damaged during the appendectomy. So it, it is deep circumflex iliac artery. Uh, you can easily appreciate the anatomical location of this artery. It is uh, at the McBurney's point. So try to connect or correlate the SPS together so that you can remember that till the exam. The next question is, the level at which the ovarian artery arises from the abdominal iota. the level at which the vein artery arises from the abdominal aorta. Okay, so the answer is uh, the level L2. I have explained uh, all the branches of the abdominal aorta in the beginning. Uh, if uh, Many of you have answered that wrong. If you find any confusion, you can again have a look at that slide after the lecture. So the next question is to perform an elective lower segment cesarean section. The obstetrician makes a transverse suprapubic incision. Which of the following abdominal wall layer will not be encountered transected during this incision? Uh, yes, B is the correct answer. Excellent. The posterior rectus sheath is absent below the arcuate line. Here in this diagram, you can see the difference above the arcuate line and difference uh, below the arcuate line. Here you can see uh, they, there is post, uh, posterior wall and anterior wall. Both are there. There is interior rectus sheath and posterior rectus sheath. While when we see the below the arcuate line, the posterior rectus sheath is absent here. So B is the right answer. Okay, so the next question is, which of the following nerves enters the thigh by passing beneath the inguinal ligament, just medial to the interior superior ilex spine?
if E is the correct answer. It continues into the anterior lateral thigh by passing either below or through the inguinal ligament, emerging just medial to the anterior superior ilex spine and anterior to the sartorius muscle. So uh, here you can see uh, the, the variants of this nerve. The course of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in the region of the anterior superior ilex spine is variable. The nerve can pass over the ilex crest or over the uh, ilex crest or over the inguinal ligament. So don't confuse if they change the word here, uh, like if they ask beneath the inguinal ligament or over the ilex crest. So make sure uh, this nerve have different variants when it passes through that. So the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and it mainly supplies the lateral cutaneous area of the thigh. So it could pass under, under the ligament, it could pass over the ligament, over and, uh, and over and under the ligament or over the ilia crest. So all are the variations of the course of uh, lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. Am I clear? Yes, you are. Okay, what is the landmark marks where the external iliac artery becomes a femoral artery? Excellent. Everyone's answer is right. B is the correct answer. Inguinal ligament. This is the landmark where external iliac artery becomes a femoral artery. Uh, this is inguinal ligament and below 30 centimeter, uh, it converted, uh, it gives rise to femoral artery. Uh, which is superficial uh, common uh, femoral artery, which further gives profunda femoral artery and superficial femoral artery. Which of the following arteries may occasionally arise as a branch of the external iliac artery or inferior epigastric artery instead of as a branch of internal iliac artery? Uh, well then, B is the correct answer. Obturator artery is most often an early branch of the anterior division of internal iliac artery, but arises from the external iliac artery either directly or via the inferior epigastric artery in approximately 19% of the individuals. So B is the right answer. So let's move on to the anatomy of pelvis. I will again give you an, uh, an overview and then we will start practicing our SPAs from this topic. So the human pelvis is composed of the bony pelvis, 
uh, pelvic cavity, pelvic floor, and the perineum. So here we have bony pelvis, pelvic cavity, and the pelvic floor. And the perineum we will discuss after uh, once we are done with the pelvis. Uh, so we had some important bony landmarks of the pelvic frame. So pelvic frame marks the entry point of the true pelvis. Above the pelvic brim is the false uh, cavity. Now let's have a look uh, in the sequence. Uh, when we go from interior to the posterior, uh, post when we go posteriorly, let's see what are the uh, bony landmarks uh, which marks the pelvic brim or the entry of the pelvic cavity. So at this point, at number one, we have upper border of symphysis pubis. Following that, uh, at this point, we have pubic crest. Then here is the pubic tubercle. Uh, then we have the pectineal line. This one is the pectineal line. Then we have iliopubic eminence. And then we have iliopectineal line. Uh, this one is the sacroiliac joint. Then we have interior ala of the sacrum. And then uh, this one is the interior ala of the sacrum and then sacral promontory. So remember this pony landmarks. Sometimes they ask you the SBA, uh, like what bony, more, uh, bony landmarks are involved uh, or mark the entry of the pelvis, true pelvis or the pelvic brim. So make sure all these points uh, form the pelvic brim. Then we have uh, important joints of the pelvis, including two sacral joint, sacroiliac joint sacrococcygeal joint, and the symphysized pubis. So we have four joints of the pelvis. Sacroiliac joint is a synovial joint. Uh, the symphysis pubis is a secondary cartilaginous joint, and these both are frequently asked in the exam. Then we have some important ligaments of the uh, pelvis. There are many ligaments, but these three ligaments are the main ligaments, which is sacrotuberous ligament, sacrospinous ligament, and iliolumbar ligament. Here you can see here is the sacrotuberous ligament, here is the sacrospinous ligament, and here is the iliolumbar ligament. And this ligament uh, is important uh, in supporting the lower limb lumbar spine. It plays an important role in restraining movement in the lumbosacral or and sacroiliac joints. And this is also asked in the exam about the function or role of the iliolumbar ligament. Then we have some diameters of true pelvis. So the true pelvis have mainly three diameters, the anterior posterior diameter, oblique diameter, and transverse diameter. So uh, mainly the pelvis, the true pelvis is divided into inlet, uh, which is also known as pelvic brim, which we have discussed recently. Then we have cavity and we have outlet. So all these uh, diameters vary accordingly. Uh, like in the pelvic brim, they have different diameters. In the cavity, they have different diameters. And in the outlet, they have different diameters. So this one is the anterior, uh, anterior posterior diameter. This one is the transverse. And this one is the oblique diameter. And this anterior, this one, anterior posterior diameter, we have further, it has three conjug conjugates. Uh, one is called anatomical conjugate obstetric conjugate and the diagonal con conjugate. How we can differentiate? Uh, this is again the anterior posterior diameter and in the anterior posterior diameter, we are further dividing that into three conjugates. So what is true conjugate? The anatomical or true conjugate measures between the sacral promontory uh, and the upper edge of the uh, pubic symphysis. Then in the obstetric conjugate, Measures from the sacral promontory uh, to the point bulging the most on the back of the symphysis. Then we have the diagonal conjugate, which marks from the again from the sacral promontory uh, to the lower edge of the symphysis pubis. So these three are the conjugates. And again, uh, the the values vary. Uh, the anterior, posterior, oblique, and transverse diameters vary according to the uh, their anatomical point. Either, uh, whenever you get a question, uh, have a look. Either they are asking about the uh, at the level of pelvic brim, uh, 
either they are asking about the uh, diameter in the cavity or the outlet. So according, uh, answer your question accordingly. Excuse then me. we have uh, pelvic cavity. The, ma it is a space kindly... inside the pelvic bones. Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, you yes. kindly read the conjugates of anterior posterior diameter. Uh, yes, sure. Okay, so we are discussing about the true pelvis. True pelvis uh, further have inlet, which is pelvic brim. Below that, we have pelvic cavity. And below that, we have pelvic outlet. There are three diameters of the uh, pelvis. One is the anterior posterior, then we have the oblique, and then we have the transverse. This is the anterior posterior diameter. This one is a uh, transverse, and this one is the oblique diameter. Out of these uh, diameters, we particularly pick the anterior posterior diameter and discuss further about the conjugates. Uh, please uh, note, transverse and oblique diameters do not have conjugates. The anterior posterior diameter has three conjugates, which are true conjugate, obstetric conjugate, and diagonal conjugate. What is true conjugate? It marks the dif uh, distance between sacral promontory. All of them have the common point, which is a sacral promontory. The difference is at the level of symphysis pubis. So when we measure the distance from sacral promontory, up to the upper border of symphysis pubis, we call that as true conjugate. When we measure the sacral promontory uh, from the point bulging behind the symphysis pubis is obstetric conjugate. When we measure the sacral promontory to the lower border of symphysis pubis, we call that uh, call it as diagonal conjugate. Am I clear now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, uh, now we have discussed the diameters of the pelvic cavity. Now have a look at the contents of the pelvic cavity. So the common contents, both in male and female, we have bladder, terminal sigmoid colon, rectum, descending colon, and distal ureters. In the females, the content of the pelvic cavity are uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, upper vagina, and cervix. In males, uh, we have was difference, seminal vesicles, and the prostate. So these are the contents of the pelvic cavity. And the purpose why we am telling you this information uh, is to just make you oriented uh, what you are uh, actually studying from the pelvic pelvis or from the perineum or from the abdomen. So just have an idea uh, what is the basics and what are the basic structures there and what is the basic blood supply, nerve innervation, and uh, the, the nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So uh, we have, for now, we have just discussed bony pelvis. Uh, we have discussed pelvic cavity. Now uh, let's have a look at pelvic floor. The muscles of the uh, pelvic floor is mainly formed by the muscles. So what are the muscles of the pelvic floor? We have four muscles, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, coccygeus muscle, and the puborectalis muscle. So all these four muscles form the pelvic floor. Then we have uh, levator and eye muscle. Uh, out of these muscles, puborectalis, iliococcygeus, and pubococcygeus, all together, these three form the levator and eye muscles. Why I highlighted the coccygeus muscle? Because there are two types of SBAs. Uh, one is a general SBA in which they just ask about uh, the muscles involved forming the pelvic floor. And the other SP in which they specifically ask about the muscles forming the levator in eye. What, uh, what mostly students do, they confuse the both SPAs or they rushly solve the SPA and they don't focus on the question statement and they uh, miss a very simple SP in that way. So make sure you, again, you study the statement carefully, read the options carefully, and go and find the correct answer. So again, if they are asking about, in general, muscles of the pelvic floor, you may include coccygeus. But if they are asking particularly about levator in eye muscle, exclude coccygeus from the options. Am I clear? Yes, you are. Okay. 
So let's start the SPS from the pelvic cavity or the pelvis, which artery supplies the distal portion of the round ligament of the uterus. Okay, Dr. Hassan, why did you go with the option B? Mm. Uh, as I remember, uh, the round ligament, it gets applied from a special branch. It's called Samson artery, which is a branch of uh, ovarian artery. Okay. But... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess because they, they describe uh, 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 exactly for distal portion of round ligament, which I uh, I think it's so close to the uterine. So I select the uterine. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm not sure. Okay. Initially, you were talking right. Uh, the, um, the round ligament is supplied by the Samson artery. Uh, but you were wrong uh, because Samson artery is a branch of inferior epigastric artery. So you were partially right and partially wrong. Let me clear. Uh, the artery of the round ligament of the uterus is also known as Samson's artery, is a branch of inferior epigastric artery. And the, the thing you were talking about, the uterine artery and the ovarian artery, yes, uh, together, uterine artery, uh, they get anastomos uh, with the Samson artery. However, uh, just remember the main arterial supply, which is inferior epigastric artery. Are you okay. clear now? It's clear. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you. Perfect. So which nerve or nerve plexus provide a sensory innervation to the cervix? Okay, well done, everyone. C is the right answer. The pelvic splanchnic nerve are pilgling parasympathetic nerve fibers that arise from the S2, S3, and S4 nerve roots of the sacral plexus. These nerves form the parasympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system in the pelvis. So C is the right answer. Well done. What type of joint is formed at the sacroiliac joint? Okay, Dr. Minan Mustafa, why did you go with the option B? I know the answer, why did you choose the option B, but I want to hear from you. I know your mistake. Uh, Dr. Minan, are you there?
Okay. Uh, the answer is E, synovial joint. Uh, sacroiliac joint, which is also known as SI joint, is diarthrodial synovial joint. It is surrounded by a fibrous capsule containing a joint space filled with synovial fluid between the articular surface. Yes, uh, you can fuse this with symphysis pubis. That is secondary cartilaginous joint. Uh, but SI joint, it, it is synovial joint. More specifically, diarthrodial synovial joint. Okay. Which of the following gives the correct pathway of piriformis muscle, origin, exit, pelvis, and insertion? Okay, uh, well done, A is the right answer. The piriformis muscle originates from the anterior sacrum and the sacroiliac joint passes to the greater sciatic foramen and insert into greater trochanter. Here you can see, uh, it is obvious uh, if we see from the lateral view, uh, it is not coming from the ventral surface. It is, coming, uh, it is not coming from the posterior aspect, from the dorsal surface. It is entirely coming from the ventral surface of the sacrum and inserting onto the greatest uh, trochan uh, greater trochanter of the femur, and it is passing through the greater sciatic foramen or greater sciatic notch. Okay, the next question is the ovaries receive innervation from which spinal segment? Okay, yes, A is the right answer. There are two contributions of the ovaries, one from the sympathetic and the other one from the parasympathetic. The sympathetic contribution is mainly through greater and lesser thoracic symplastic nerve, which is T10 and T11. And the parasympathetic comes from S2, S3, and S4. Uh, the nerve, uh, which is, uh, follows the course of ovarian artery to reach the pelvis, a sympathetic supply to the ovary, distal uterine tube, and the uterine fundus. 
uh, whereas the parasympathetics fly again to the ovary, distal uterine tube, and the uterine venous. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am, you are clear. Which of the following ligaments allow us to stand upright with a minimum of muscular support? Okay, D iliofemoral uh, is the right answer. This ligament plays a crucial role in stabilizing the pelvis and allowing us to stand upright with a minimal muscular effort. It helps to support the sacrum and the coccyx, thereby contributing to the stability of the pelvic girdle and the spine. Uh, here you can see the iliofemoral ligament. Which of the following muscles leave the lesser pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen? Yes, T is the right answer. We have uh, just discussed this SPA in a different way. So piriformis muscle, uh, it leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. Okay, when the body is in upright position, the expected angle between the brim of the pelvis to the horizontal plane is approximately. Uh, Dr. Saima, basically artery and vein. Basically, we covered this uh, under the contents of greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. So basically, the piriformis muscle, it is a muscle which uh, mainly plays a role in forming the greater and the lesser sciatic foramen. And above the piriformis, we divide further uh, what contents are passing above the piriformis muscle and below the piriformis muscle in the greater sciatic foramen. And then we have the different contents, different arteries, veins, and nerve, which pass uh, through the lesser sciatic foramen. Thanks, man. Okay, excellent. Uh, C is the right answer. The standing position, the plane of the pelvic frame to inlet creates an angle between 50 to 60 degrees with the horizontal plane. Okay, uh, the lymphatics of the sigmoid colon drain into. Well done. C is the right answer. The descending colon and sigmoid colon drain into the inferior mesentic nodes. And the lymph nodes surrounding the inferior mesentic nodes uh, artery drain directly into pre-aortic nodes. So C is the right answer, which is inferior mesentic and pre-aortic lymph nodes. Okay, what is the blood supply of the sigmoid colon?
PSC is the right answer. Well done again. As the sigmoid colon develops as a hindgut structure, it receives its blood supply from the inferior mesenteric artery and in specific sigmoidal branches. So please tell me what is the vertebral level of inferior mesenteric artery? L3. Yes, that's correct. Inferior mesenteric artery uh, originates at the level of L3. That's correct. So let's start the anatomy of perineum. The perineum uh, basically can be divided into two triangular portions by the line between the ischial tuberosities. Here you can see uh, the anterior portion is called the urogenital triangle and the posterior portion is known, uh, is known as the anal triangle. So here you can see the anterior portion, this is the urogenital triangle, and whereas this portion, which is the posterior portion, is known as anal triangle. The anal orifice can be appreciated in the anal triangle, uh, while the respective external genitalia occupy the urogenital triangle of the either sex. In the perineum, uh, I have uh, added some of the important topics, which are, these are the high yield topics uh, from the perineum, which is ischiorectal fossa or ischioanal fossa. And I have also added the pudendal canal. So what is ischioanal fossa? The anal canal is present in the middle of the anorectal triangle and on each side is the ischioanal fossa. So here is the uh, anal canal and on each side we have this fossa which is ischiorectal fossa. Uh, the ischiorectal fossa is limited and comp uh, comprised of the following structures. So these are the boundaries. Medially, uh, this is correct. Uh, if you see the diagram and uh, appreciate the boundaries of this uh, fossa, if you look at the medial side, it is formed by the external anal sphincter. And on the lateral side, it is formed uh, by the obturator internus muscle and its fascia. And the roof is formed by the levator ani muscle. And the base uh, is mainly formed by the, uh, by the skin. And the space between the borders filled with loo loose adipose tissue. So here in the yellow color are the adipose tissues. Again, here you can see this uh, uh, is the, in the highlighted area, this is the SQNL fossa. Again, it have lateral boundary, which is formed by the obturator internus muscle and fascia. And it have medial boundary, uh, which is mainly formed by the external anal sphincters. Here we have adipose tissue, which are filled, and uh, its roof, roof is formed by the levator in eye muscle, and the base is formed by the skin. So this is uh, all, all about the ischioanal fossa. And if you look at closely, here we have the pudendal canal. Let me I'll give, show you the slide. The pudendal canal is also known as Alcox canal. It's the anatomical structure in the pelvis through which internal pudendal artery, internal pudendal vein, and the pudendal nerve uh, and nerve to obturator nerve pass. Again, here you have uh, pudendal canal, which is also known as Alcox canal. And here you can appreciate the contents of this canal, which are mainly, uh, please remember, it is internal pudendal artery and internal pudendal vein and the pudendal nerve. Uh, these are the branches. I have added this uh, algorithm uh, of the branches of the internal iliac artery uh, so that uh, later on, whenever you are studying and solving SPAs, you can have a look and easily solve your SPAs. And here are the branches of external iliac artery. Uh, uh, this, uh, in, if you study the algorithms, uh, it, it is very easy to remember the branches of any of the artery. Please pick a slide. Yes. Um, Ethanol. Ethanol. Uh, this one? Ethanol. Let's pick this one. This one? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. okay, let me read this for you. So we know we have common iliac artery, which bifurcates at the um, into external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery at the level of L5 to S1. 
and this internal iliac artery gives further branches, uh, mainly the superior vesicle artery, obturator artery, inferior vesicle artery. Then we have middle rectal artery, internal pudendal artery, and superior and inferior gluteal arteries. So these are the branches of internal iliac artery. And here is the area of supply, like where they are, uh, these arteries are supplying to its structures. Likewise, we have an algorithm of external iliac artery and the area they are supplying. If we look at the external iliac artery, it gives femoral artery, which moving downwards and give popliteal artery. This popliteal artery further divides into interior tibial, posterior tibial, and then fibular. And for, uh, from posterior tibial, it gives a peroneal branch, and the anterior tibial and posterior together form the dorsalis pedis artery, dorsal arch, and plantar arch. However, for this exam, there is no need to study about the blood supply of the lower limb. Uh, just focus on the blood supply of the structures, which are mainly located in the abdomen, pelvis, and the perineum. Okay, uh, some SPS come from the fetal skull as well. So, uh, when we look at the anatomy or an, uh, the bony structures of the fetal skull, we have two frontal bones, two parietal bones, and one occipital bone. And many questions come from the formation of sutures. So there are three main sutures you need to remember, the coronal suture, sagittal suture, and the lambdoid suture. How the coronal suture is formed? Here you can see this is a coronal suture. Uh, this one is a sagittal suture. And this one is a lambdoid suture. So a coronal suture uh, forms by each frontal bone plate meets with the parietal bone plate at the coronal suture. Then sagittal suture, this extends from the front of the head to the back, down to the middle of the top of head. The two parietal bones uh, plates meet at the sagittal suture. Uh, the lambdoid suture extends across the back of the head each parietal bone plate uh, meets the occipital uh, bone plate at the lambdoid suture. So just remember these points. Many SPS come from this topic. Okay, let's solve some SPS from the perineum. Which of the following structures separate the superficial perineal pouch from the deep perineal pouch? Uh, yes, D and E both have the same options. Uh, in the exam, it happens. It happened with me. There are two questions uh, which have two correct options. And there were two questions which are repeated in the exam. In my, I'm talking about my exam experience. So if you find in the exam uh, that two correct options are there, like, uh, for example, in this uh, question, then don't get panicked. If you choose D, you will get a mark. If you choose E, then again, you will get a mark. And if the questions are repeating, uh, for example, if this question, uh, you solve that question uh, and it was question number one, and question number 10 again, come, uh, which, is, which have the same question, then definitely you will get, get the marks from both questions if you solve them correctly. Okay, so D or E, either you go with the D or E, that's the same thing. So the perineal membrane is a dense fibrotic layer 
situated over the urogenital triangle. In both sexes, the urogenital triangle is divided into superficial and a deep perineal space by the perineal membrane. So this transparent layer, this is the perineal membrane and it divides the superficial and deep perineal pouch. Okay, which of the following arteries give rise to the deep dorsal penile artery? A is the correct answer. Well done. Deep dorsal penile artery is a branch of internal pudendal artery. Uh, in this diagram, it is uh, all about the blood supply of the penis. So here you can see how the internal pudendal artery uh, give rise to further arteries, including the dorsal artery, dorsal penile artery, cavernous artery, and it is also supplying the corpus cavernosum, and also it is giving the smaller branches to the glans penis. Okay, the bifurcation of the abdominal aorta occurs at the level of which of the fulvic structures? Excellent. B is the right answer. The aortic bifurcation is usually seen at the level of L4, just above the junction of left and right common iliac veins. The aortic bifurcation can, uh, can be localized not only by its uh, usual position in, in relation to L4, but also by its relation to the iliac crest. So here you can see uh, this is the highest point of iliac crest, and at this level, the bifurcation, this is the level L4, and how uh, you can see how it is bifurcating at this level. Which of the following describes the correct order of musculature of the anal canal from deep to superficial? Uh, arrange these followings, deep part of external sphincter, subcutaneous part of external sphincter, uh, internal sphincter, and superficial part of external sphincter. Arrange this in the correct order. Uh, Dr. Lisa, we will cover 30 SBS today, so five more to go. Okay, uh, well done, C is the right answer. Let me show you how we arrange them. Deep to superficial, we go. Uh, we have internal sphincter, deep part of external sphincter, superficial part of external sphincter. Then we have subcutaneous part of external sphincter. Now, uh, let me show you how we go from uh, deep to superficial. So here we have uh, first in internal sphincter, 
then we have uh, different parts of external sphincter, including uh, if we go in the sequence, we have deep part, then we have super superficial part, then we have subcutaneous part. So this is how we arrange them from deep to superficial level. And please always make sure uh, either they are asking from deep to superficial or superficial to deep. In that case, you have to reverse the order. Okay, which of the following arteries supplies the anorectal canal uh, superior to the pectinate fly? Perfect. C is the right answer. Okay, what happens? Uh, we got two types of question from the blood supply of anorectal canal. Either they ask you about the above pectinate line, or they may ask you below pectinate line. So, or uh, they may use the word sphere two third or inferior to uh, one third. So, don't confuse these terms. Uh, so, the above pectinate line in the arterial supply is through superior rectal artery which is a branch of inferior mesenteric artery. If we look at the below pectinate line or inferior one-third of the anal canal, uh, then it is supplied by the um, middle and inferior rectal artery. And inferior rectal artery is a branch of internal pudendal artery. Okay, and an obstetrician performs a medial lateral episiotomy to expand the birth canal during the childbirth. Which of the following muscles is typically incised during this procedure? Okay, perfect. A is the right answer. The structures cut during episiotomy are skin, subcutaneous tissue, uh, perineal fascia, perineal muscles, bulbosponges, uh, and the branches of pudendal vessel and the nerves uh, and the nerves and posterior vaginal wall. So I have a question: Which nerve damaged uh, during the episiotomy? Which nerve is at the risk of uh, damage? during uh, medial episiotomy. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Lisa, Dr. Ashi, and uh, Dr. Ashim, well done. Okay, Dr. Aisha, the previous answer about, okay, the blood supply of the endorectal canal, we usually divide it uh, by above pectinate line and below pectinate line. So above pectinate line is supplied by the branch of inferior mesenteric artery through superior rectal artery. Whereas below the pectinate line, uh, it is supplied by the branch of internal parental artery. Am I clear now? OK. OK, 
Okay, what forms the lateral wall of the ischiorectal fossa? And don't worry, if we have time in the end, I will review those questions which some of you have missed. I think someone have missed question number 23 and someone missed question number 15, I guess. Okay, sure, Dr. Savish. If we have time in the end, then definitely I will go back to those questions. Okay, well done. Uh, C is the right answer. Uh, Ischiorectal fossa are laterally bounded by the obturator internus muscle and its fascia. Uh, here again in this diagram, again learn this, this topic comes frequently in the exam, so understand its relations. Uh, laterally obturated uh, obturator internus muscle and its fascia, medially by the, uh, by the external sphincter, and it has the roof is formed by the levator in eye muscle. A 30 year old uh, para one plus zero woman presents with painful, painful swelling in the right posterior lateral part of vagina and fever for three days. Diagnosis of Bartholin's abscess is made. Incision and drainage is planned. What is the anatomical location of Bartholin gland? Excellently is the right answer. The Bartholin glands are located within the superficial cranial pouch of the urogenital triangle. Uh, what is superficial cranial pouch? It is a potential space between the cranial membrane squarely and the superficial cranial fascia inferiorly. The other contents of the superficial cranial pouch are erectile tissues that form the penis and the clitoris, three muscles in, including ischiochoronosis, bulbospongiosis, and superficial transverse cranial muscle. So all these are the contents of superficial cranial pouch, including the Bartholin gland. A 35-year-old diabetic woman underwent vaginal surgery. Post-op, she has loss of cutaneous sensation over the interior and lateral surface of the thigh. The compression of which nerve is likely to be responsible? Yes, B is the right answer. How it is the right answer? 
The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, also referred as lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, is formed by the spinal nerves L2, uh, L3. In the thigh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve gives two branches, the anterior branch and the posterior branch. And this anterior branch uh, supplies the skin of anterior lateral thigh to the knee, and the posterior branch innervates the skin to the lateral aspect of the greater trochanter to the mid thigh region and sometimes to the gluteal region as well. And this, in this particular scenario, uh, the patient has loss of cutaneous sensation over the anterior and lateral surface of the thigh, uh, which is a classical innervated area by the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh. Here in this diagram, again, it is, uh, it is highlighting the area uh, which is affected by the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. Am I audible to everyone? This one's hearing you. Okay. Okay, are you clear about uh, the innervation of lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh? Yeah. Okay, so if anyone have any question, you can ask me. Um, will it be possible for you to go back through the question where we were discussing the nerve support? Yes, definitely. Uh, which uh, particular question you are requesting me to repeat? I'm not sure which number it was, but it was the question related to the inner supply of the survey. Okay, if you remember any key point, I can go back to the slides and find that question for you. Okay, uh, Dr. Serge, one, two, three, and 23. Okay, so yes, uh, this video would be uploaded on our website. You can later on watch there. Okay, so the question one was, while performing laparoscopy, the lateral umbilical folds can be seen on the anterior abdominal wall in the adults. Uh, this structure contains Okay, so mainly contains, where is that slide? On the slide. Okay, here we have, uh, it, uh, the structure it contains is the inferior epigastric vessel. The uh, lateral umbilical folds are basically bilateral raised ridges of the parietal peritoneum in the deep aspect of the anterior abdominal wall overlying the inferior epigastric vessel. Are you clear? Okay, so the second question is, which vessels can possibly be injured in the subcutaneous tissue when a transfer suprapubic skin incision is made?
Okay, so the answer is superficial epigastric artery. It is a branch of femoral artery and runs obliquely upwards and medially across the lower abdomen. Uh, it supplies blood to the skin, subcutaneous tissue of the lower abdominal wall below the umbilicus. Uh, Dr. Ruby, uh, this essay is for you. You were asking this question. Th this artery can be encountered during a transverse suprapubic skin incision. Which structure blocks a blood supply to the loop of small intestine and femoral ring causing strangulated femoral hernia? Yes, B is the right answer, lacunar ligament. Uh, lacunar ligament uh, is the only boundary of the femoral canal that can be cut during the surgery to release femoral hernia. And uh, sometimes it happens, femoral hernia is, um, is at high risk of getting strangulated. So there are many, many chances that uh, if someone has femoral hernia, uh, that might get strangulated later on. So strangulation is compression of the hernia, um, which has compromised the blood supply, leading to the bowel becoming ischemic. So that's another complication. If a person has a moral hernia and ultimately uh, he or she uh, had the strangulation of that hernia, that ultimately leads to uh, the bowel ischemia. So that's why whenever uh, we are performing the surgery of femoral hernia, what we usually do, we release the lacunar ligament and help to redu reduce the chances of the bowel ischemia as well as we reduce the femoral hernia as well. And uh, what artery is responsible for this bowel ischemia is the inferior epigastric artery. So these are the high yield points from this topic. Am I clear to everyone? Okay, so someone asked me to repeat question number 23 as well. Hi, Dr. Sumbal. Uh, Hello. Central reminder, you have another session. Okay, thank you so much for reminding me. Can okay. we watch it? Yes. Okay, so everyone, uh, thank you so much for uh, activi uh, actively participating with us. So what I would suggest you now to speed up your exam preparation because you have very limited time and don't spend too much time on doing theory and try to uh, do your preparation in a focused and strategic way. And if any time you need our help, our assistance, uh, me and my team, we all at Med Institutors are here for your help. Uh, you can contact us anytime. And if, uh, because we have a limited time right now, so uh, post your, all of your questions on our Telegram group or on the WhatsApp group. I will try to re uh, reply everyone at my earliest convenience. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, see you in the next live session. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Welcome. Okay.